Today we'll be using a, a bit of a sports metaphor as we go through the process of talking about winning your interview. And uh, get ready for the game. Think about how you carry yourself, your dress, your appearance. What do you want the interviewer to see as you approach them? Remember, someone is always watching. And I'm going to start with a brief story, and this came from a consultant. Uh, a, an executive had been asked to come to a firm to interview, and he obviously arrived early. And he took the opportunity to sit in his car, and he cleaned out his ashtray, unfortunately, beside the car. Uh, the worst thing that happened to him, the hiring manager happened to be watching out the window that day. And as you can imagine, later in the interview process, when the manager connected with this candidate, the interview was over. So as you approach your interview, remember the receptionist, the secretary, if you happen to be there and there's other interviewees, always be as courteous as possible and be on guard. One of my favorite quotes, and uh, all my employees have heard this, is to be early is to be on time. If you just try and be on time, you're going to end up being late. There are many things you can recover from during the interview process, but being late is not one of them. You certainly want to show energy and confidence as you get ready for the game. And remember that your nonverbal communication could be a very positive uh, opportunity for you. Uh, how you sit in the chair, how you, how you walk, uh, how you handle yourself in the cafeteria, those sort of things. So as a pregame warm-up, you want to visualize these sort of things and be ready to go for the interview itself. Fundamentals. Why did you choose your particular field of study? Someone will ask that question. Why did you decide to further your education? Same type of question. In both of these, you can think about these as goals that you've achieved. And again, if you use the vocabulary and talk about goals and achievement, those things stick with the interviewers. They may ask why you're interested in pursuing a career in that functional area. Uh, if it's finance or HR or engineering, you can talk about making a difference, preparing yourself to move up, gaining credibility, and then describe what you want to be in terms of an individual or perhaps a leader or manager in your organization. When you tell these stories, uh, you certainly want to give enough information to convey your your why answer. Don't get too detailed at this point. Uh, leave out minute personal details. If it's not relevant, don't add it at this point. You may have to explain why you're available today. Certainly the students that are graduating have a wonderful story. I've just completed my curriculum. If you're mid-career, you will have to explain why you're available, why you're looking, uh, what this particular interview means to your career path. Okay. If you're an alumni, one of the things you'll need to talk about in terms of fundamentals for the why is how have you maintained yourself? And these are questions that if you've been in a position for four or five years and your company has a tuition reimbursement program or if they have training opportunities, you'll need to explain those that you took advantage of. And if you did not, why didn't you? Remember, you were invited to the interview. You've already been selected to a certain degree. You're there to confirm or reaffirm why you were selected. Fundamentals. We all have strengths and weaknesses. And you can see by the comments on the screen, assessments and performance reviews. For those of you that have been in the workforce, uh, you've probably had a number of these. And you should take them seriously. I hope when you had your review or your assessment that there were no surprises. If your environment is one of development and continuous learning, there should be no surprises when you get to your performance review. And you should take an active part in working with your manager or your HR department to identify those and continue to improve in those areas. You also may have an opportunity to have a 360, which is a review by individuals that you report to, your peers, and those that report to you. Those are generally private and done for developmental purposes, and your HR department should help you with those. Also, many universities are beginning to use these tools when students enter the campus and mid-career, if you have a two-year program as well, Take advantage of these. It's important that you use this opportunity while basically in a safe harbor, the university environment, to learn how to use these. Because you will encounter these, particularly if you're a high potential, good talent, you will encounter them again as you join the workforce. Know your weaknesses. Sometimes a strength can be a weakness. If, it's, if you have a particular skill that you overdo, uh, it can become a weakness because you become narrowly focused. Admit and own that you may have development opportunities. There's a, a saying I like, and I've got to give credit to Lao Tzu. It's Chinese. And I've paraphrased it, but knowing others is intelligence. Knowing yourself is true wisdom. 
And as you go into this process of the interview and you know yourself, your strengths and weaknesses, and you're not there to admit weaknesses, you're there to talk about how you can mitigate or improve or add to or strengthen those things that you consider a weakness, that'll be very important. One other comment as an example is I've worked with executives who have used a scale to ask you about your strengths and weaknesses and they'll say something like, tell me what your best strength is on a scale of 1 to 10 with 10 being the highest. And obviously if you pick 10 you have a challenge. If you pick 5 and you want to be average, that's a challenge. But the 7, 8, 9 in between it leaves yourself some room to demonstrate your strengths and also to recognize you've got room for improvement. A pretty basic response, but those are the type of questions that you'll run into when they're asking you to evaluate yourself. Fundamentals. Okay. Um, in our game plan, you know, we got first quarter and halftime, and then at the end of the game, obviously we want to win. That's why we're here. But you may be asked in the short term, say one to five years, or the mid to long term, five to ten, what's your career goal? What's a typical career path for you? How do you think about fit? What is your vision of your career? When you think about answering that question, certainly if you just want to say, I want to be a vice president, uh, I'm not picking on the banking industry, but that would be a place I would start because there's many vice presidents in banks. But you may want to think a different way about how you describe what you want. And if you think about jobs in terms of the knowledge you bring, the complexity of the problems that you're allowed to solve, and then the degree of autonomy or accountability you have, you want to be able to describe that you want to earn knowledge of the organization, you want additional responsibility, you want more complexity in your problems to be solved, and you hope that those lead to certainly senior individual contributors or managerial or senior executive positions. So if you think about describing what you're trying to achieve in those terms of knowledge, problem solving, and accountability, and some of you in the HR profession will notice those are key pieces of the Hay Method, that will help describe what you're looking for. A title may be elusive or may be misrepresentative of what you're really looking for. What you want is accountability and leadership position at the appropriate time that you know your business and your industry. One thing you got to think about in your career is you start out, you're going to manage yourself, okay? And from there you manage other individuals. Then you manage managers. You may manage a function or a department. If you think about managing managers, function or department, you think about setting a vision. It's a little bit of a different objective setting process. From there you may become the head of a business or an enterprise. Then you're dealing with internal and external vision and leadership. So you can see as you go from managing yourself to others, to a department, to a business, your skills, the complexity, the accountability changes. But be mindful in all these steps you're still managing yourself and don't forget your personal maintenance plan and your own development. Okay, the fundamentals. See, we want to know our, I, I guess it's, I shouldn't call it a competitor, but keeping the sports metaphor, uh, we're interviewing a company today and uh, we want to know and be prepared to understand who they are and what's happening. So you want to do your research, pretty basic. You want to understand their product or service they offer. Uh, you may want to do some homework on what their competition is. Very importantly is you want to know what their core values are. What do they think their competencies are? And then fit and passion for you with that company. There's a couple of uh, documents uh, you may want to reference. Uh, these are a SEC documents that can give you additional insight to the company on an annual basis, their quarterly fiscal pro progress or any material changes. And these are called a 10K, which is an annual report, a 10Q, which is a quarterly report, comes out three times a year, and an 8K, which is a report that's required in, I believe, approximately four days following a material event such as a change in CEO or asset movements or plant closures, key events in a company. These are resources to know more about the organization you're interviewing. You also may want to look at any analyst reports that may be recorded and kept on the the company's website. You want to know their product and service. Uh, what's their market share? What's their latest introduction into the marketplace? What's their R&D effort? Uh, if possible, how are they doing in reinvesting capital into their organization? These are all clues as to the vision of the company. And as you, as you talk to them about the company, you want to make sure that 
to understand how you match up with the job in the company. Is this where you want to be? Is it a flat organization? Does it have a number of layers? Is it a division with a corporate, international offices that allow a lot of growth? Those things you'll need to know, and we'll come back and talk about that near the end of the discussion to make sure that uh, you have what you need at the end of the day to make a decision. Uh, when you're talking about a company's competencies, I just want to share an example. I had worked with one company that uh, they produced personal checks, and you would think that printing was their core competency or selling, but as it turned out, their real core competency was their IT function. And that's because in providing personal checks to the customers of banks, managing approximately 54 million customers and their needs for checks and other documents became an IT function imperative. The real skill set was managing the customer base and communicating with them. Uh, while printing the checks and doing it well was important, that wasn't really the core competency. It was really the knowledge and the information and managing that information became. So as you talk to a company, find out what their competency is and make judgments as to the competitiveness of that position that the company tells you. Fit and passion, that's pretty straight up. Um, you know, are, there, are the people excited about what they're doing? Uh, you can sense that from the interviewers. Um, when you look at the fit and passion, are they doing things that are consistent with your values? Um, I'm touching back on another topic here, core values and competencies. But your values come into play as well. How do they extend themselves into their communities? Is it through United Way or Habitat for Humanity? Do they sponsor cancer uh, collections? Find out what passion the organization has and does that fit with yours. And when you join the company, become engaged in those. For those of you that are students, uh, you've probably done a great job of joining organizations and leading them. Uh, don't lose that passion when you join a company. There will be many opportunities and that allows you chances to meet people that potentially could become mentors or partners or individuals that you would want on your staff later in your career at that company. So take advantage of those moments and, and really become a part of the company just as you have on the campus and joining the organizations that are available. I need to give credit to uh, Jill on this next piece. Uh, what Jill has provided is uh, as we go into our game plan, you, know, you have to visualize your plays and anticipate situations that you're going to be put in. And this is the play we'll use. Well, it's the same thing for the interview. And what Jill has provided here is uh, what's called the STAR method, and I think many of you have probably seen that, but it's something to really keep in your pocket as a way to how you think. Be careful, my caveat here is don't try to memorize your stories. You will get tangled up. You know, be an interesting person, be comfortable in what you talk about, and it will flow very nicely for you. So as you visualize your plays, um, formulate responses. You know, think about a time Here's the question you may receive. It'll be very simple. Tell me about a time when you had a success, or a failure, or a team event, or a particular exciting solution. And as you tell the story, you want to be reasonably concise, set the stage, so show some passion. Uh, if you took the initiative, say it. Describe the task that you identified. Uh, I've heard some executives in many ways say something along the lines, if you see a problem, you own a problem. And what that means is you're not getting into someone else's job. It's just if you see something, if you're committed to your company, reach out to that other person to say, how can I help you? How can I become involved? I see a problem I'd like to help. Describe the task, describe the situation, determine the task, show the actions you took, how did you gather resources, whether it was people, other types of resources, what you did, and then the result. One important thing in this model is the result really doesn't end right there. Because when you conclude a project, you've got to think, did I, I guess, did I put it to bed? Will it not reoccur again? Did I put something in place that will prevent reoccurrence? Did I leave some procedures in place? Did I really solve it? Or did I just fix a problem that was there today? So when you're Describing the situation, anticipate that you will be probed at each of these levels and you must be prepared to go another level down to describe what you did or how you encouraged others or how at the end you gave the credit to others. Very powerful statement. Okay, as you execute this game plan with the star, 
as I said, you want to give it life. Uh, you, you want to identify that need that really jumped out or that, that problem you saw. Focus on action and results. Don't backtrack in your story. Don't become worry, worried or uh, try to demonstrate your breadth of knowledge of every person in the organization. Stay focused because this is what they're going to they're going to say. They'll be looking at you and saying, "Gee, if this person were in my organization today, and this were the approach that she or he took, would this really fit?" Okay. So don't backtrack. Finish the story. Make sure that you're telling the story. That the interviewer is not having to pull it out of you. Keep it on a nice pace and and just be prepared for the probing questions. Have qualitative or quantitative results. Don't say it got better. That's not going to get it. You know, if you also do not want to overstate your case. Uh, I've seen situations where reviewing some student resumes and here at Craner where they put down a large number on the resume because they were looking for impact. So this person said that he was working on a twenty million dollar project. In reality, he was the equivalent of a purchase follow-up analyst who was simply executing orders against a preset schedule and customers that had already set agreements. So his impact was really timeliness, execution, and follow-up. Had nothing to do with $20 million. So you want to avoid putting things on your resume that you have to explain away. It would have been much more powerful to talk about how he organized that and the number of shipments that were on time, how accounts payable was taken care of, and just the efficiency of how that person managed the situation as opposed to I belong to a $20 million project. It may be helpful for some of you to actually do an outline and practice your stories. Um, again, do this without memorizing. What you want to do is be comfortable in the sequence of the star itself, the situation, the task, and take yourself through the results and then how you concluded the project. And you may have someone uh, just practice firing a couple of those questions at you and just handle them at random. That will be very helpful in preparation for the game. One other thing to think about is vary your examples. There's certainly a tendency of recency bias to talk about something you may have just accomplished at work, but uh, for those of you that may be mid-career or looking for new positions uh, and you're out in the workplace, uh, re even referencing things you accomplished in college that are similar to what you did in the workplace today, those can be very beneficial. It demonstrates a consistency in your behaviors and how you attack problems. Again, while you're doing this, uh, I'll, I'll be a little repetitive once in a while here and I apologize, but being an interesting person and continuing that, remember the game plan we had of being courteous, knowing that you're sort of being watched by everyone and be gracious at all times. Uh, again, as you go through the day, uh, you know, thanking those that are helping you in the process is also a benefit as well. You don't know who may tip the scales. Final play. Uh, I guess this is the point where uh, you got a last chance to score, I guess. It's near the end of whatever game we're playing here. And you want to make sure that you've asked the interviewer what you need to know. Uh, what is the role of the position, the type of projects, duration, uh, budget responsibilities that may be required in the job that you're considering? Um, you also may want to ask about, and there's two ways to think of this, typical career path or sometimes I like to call it a map because uh, you know we're here in West Lafayette and you certainly can take one road to Chicago that's certainly a path but you can take many others to get there and and what this allows you is to gain experiences in other divisions other knowledge and other functional areas so the career path for you may be a straight line or it may have a lot of diagonal opportunities in it as you build your credibility and strength of knowledge inside your organization and with that you'll learn the organizational structure that is the decision-making process, the budgeting process, the vocabulary. So those are things you'll want to accumulate as you join an organization and begin to move up. Another important piece is travel, international assignments. You will be asked by someone, are you mobile? What part of the country would you like to live in? Would you like to live in Southeast Asia or Europe? I think uh, this will be categorized as Tom's advice up front, but I would be mobile until you have to make a decision. Uh, keep your options open. You don't know what, whether you're mobile three years, five years, ten years from now, what your current situation is personally and, and whether you can take those opportunities. But many corporations today see an international assignment as perhaps a prerequisite to moving to senior management. 
and they can be short-term uh, non-expat, six to 12 months, or they could be expat assignments at three to five years. These are enormously broadening for your career. They're virtually the equivalent of another degree if you have that opportunity. I'm a very strong proponent. If you have a chance for an international assignment, take it and enjoy it. One other thing you may want to talk about during the interview is any uh, recent news about the company uh, that has been in the press or you've heard about or you found out from colleagues or other people that work there. Um, it's, it demonstrates a contemporary awareness of what's going on at the organization and a desire to uh, yeah, you demonstrate you've done your homework. Okay? So with these, you've got your personal considerations that you can line up and say, is this still a good fit for me? And you want to be true to yourself. If this is not a fit, you know, you should, you should recognize that and, and move on. What you don't want to do is accept a position and find out a year and a half, two years into the position that you're out interviewing again and have to use all these skills over again that quickly. So make sure you make your decision well and you've done your homework and you've got what you need out of the interview process. As you conclude the, the sort of final play, you want to ask the interviewer um, what the next step in the process is. And what you're looking for there is uh, fundamentally timing. So as you walk off the field, you've been you've gathered the personal information you need, you know the timing, uh, you demonstrated the uh, accomplishments you've achieved either at school or through your current uh, workplace environment, and you, you're at home, the game's over. Now what do I do? Yeah, you want to thank the recruiter for their time and consideration. Uh, be sure you re reiterate interest. I, I, I was amazed during my career the number of times I interviewed candidates, and I would speak to them probably twice during the interview process, and you know what? They forgot to say, I really want the job. It's, it's OK to be uh, modestly aggressive in stating that you know, the day has been very beneficial. It's added information that's certainly reinforced the decision as to why I was interested in your company, and I'm very pleased to tell you I would like to continue my candidacy. It's OK to put a, a statement together like that, that you leave a favorable impression that the day was very beneficial and it was well constructed and helped you in your decision process. As you leave with the interviewer, uh, some people call these hot button comments, but you may find that the interviewer, uh, uh, there's a personal connection you can make, either through art or sports or there may be something that you have a common interest. Uh, don't hesitate to bring that up at the at the end. It's it's uh, I should have mentioned this earlier, but again, it's about the differentiation that you make as you conclude the day, and you leave, and you know there's other interview ease that are coming in. Uh, what differentiates you? What makes you stand out when that interviewer has to talk to the hiring manager and, and explain the best candidate? So again, this is about being an interesting person. Those of you that have multiple languages, be sure and state that. Multiple cultural experiences, make sure they know that. Add any relevant new information that may have occurred to you during the day. You may have missed something early that a, an interviewer later in the day brought up, and you want to sort of uh, make sure that the, the HR person or the final interviewer has that additional information. And be excited about the future interaction. If you're truly interested in the company, you really should demonstrate it as you leave. You know, and again, it's how you're carrying yourself. It's been a long day. You've probably had five or six interviews. You're tired. Uh, in Indiana, it's 98 degrees outside right now. Uh, you want to show you're excited about what just occurred and how you can benefit their company in the future. OK, now you have to wrap up. Uh, you're back. And you're sort of reading the newspaper about the game and how it went. And you think, now what do I do to make sure that this is a, a good opportunity for myself? There's a little debate on this particular part of the subject. But my recommendation, and uh, Jill and I have discussed this, is a thank you note to each of the interviewers would be appropriate. And it would be good to tailor those. And during the day, you should collect business cards. And to the best of your ability, take notes as the day goes on. It will help you in your thank you notes. It will also help you frame the job a little bit as you think about it on the way home. But sending that personal thank you note is a differentiator. If you send an email, while that's efficient and certainly may be OK, 
uh, your email will be just like the other six or seven emails that come in from the interviewing process. And I, I will confess, in the, the world I came from, the interview, the, the email it just seemed to be uh, way too efficient from where I came from. The personal note uh, was very powerful, and it was a differentiator. And it gives you a chance to reaffirm your strength, reaffirm your interests, and also to make sure your, your contact information is correct. I've, at least two or three times in my career, uh, recruiting firm, firms will take your data and transpose it onto another document and will have a bad phone number or bad address. And unfortunately, we've missed a candidate because of that. So don't hesitate at each opportunity to make sure they have your current data to make contact with you. So again, and just, it's just a great opportunity to demonstrate how you communicate. It will give the hiring manager uh, the other decision makers a chance to look at you in terms of how does this person interact when they potentially talk to other employees, how they talk to prospective customers, current customers, suppliers. To take that extra initiative to make that contact and reach out can be very powerful. Certainly an email is efficient, uh, but I think uh, you want to stand out in this process. Again, continuing to be courteous. Uh, there's two contacts you'll make. One will be this note we just talked about of thanks. The second will be, remember as we left the field, we found out what the next steps are. If someone says, we'll get back to you in a week, uh, that would be my next time to contact them. I would schedule it, make a call, or send an email. Be courteous. Uh, what you don't know on the other side is uh, things may happen if it's going long. There could have been a budget change. There could have been a product issue. Uh, there could have been uh, candidates that had to reschedule or executives that could, many things could get in the way of the decision process. So give them a little room, but be timely, uh, an email or a follow-up phone call when that scheduled date occurs is certainly appropriate. And be positive. Uh, be accepting of uh, what they have to say and ask them for the next date if they can't make a decision. If you're invited back, that's great. If you receive a message that you're not selected, it presents you for another, uh, with another opportunity. And uh, ask them what was the difference between you and the best candidate. It may be something very small, or it may be experience. It may be uh, the other candidate in maintaining themselves. When I talk about individuals out in their career, uh, was a member, became a CPA, and they had their certification, or a certified engineer, or a senior professional in human resources. Perhaps it was that simple differentiator where someone continued their education and continued to manage themselves by maintaining their professional accreditations. Maybe that was a difference maker. You want to know what that is because you don't want to have this happen again. Okay, we've uh, that concludes the formal portion of the presentation today. And what we want to do is answer some questions. That have come in. And All right, thanks, Tom. We do have a few questions here. Uh, and again, if you're listening and we don't get to a question that you were thinking about, you still have time to type one in. But we have a question here about other behavioral uh, question methods. And it says the SAO model, situation, action, outcome. Uh, what did you do? Why did you do it? What you learned? Uh, what's your experience with that, Tom? Have you, have you worked very much with the SAO model? Well, the Really, the difference between that and using the STAR to prepare for it, it, it they're very similar. The, the situation, the action, the outcome, uh, again, they're very close and parallel. Uh, early in my career, yes, I followed these standard models. Toward the end of my career, I used my own. Uh, but that, that's a very good way to think about how you approach your, interviewer, your interview. And again, be sure not to simply memorize. You want to characterize your story in an interesting way so that you are an interesting person. And uh, I've, I've got to say, I've interviewed uh, students on campus. And it's typically 12 or 14. Uh, and listen carefully. You're all wearing black. You've all got a one page. And you've all gone to the same training session on how to do an interview. Guess what? You all sound exactly the same. So as you describe your situations, you want to be interesting how you accomplished it. Uh, the models are good for practice, but don't use them to stifle what you want to talk about in terms of creativity. You talked during the uh, one of the last comments you made was about getting feedback. And sometimes it will come down that you didn't have the experience of another candidate. 
So we have a question here. If you know going into the interview that experience is going to be a big factor, how do you separate yourself from the candidates who do have that experience going in? How do you overcome what could be a potential obstacle? Well, it's, uh, I guess we assume the educational credentials are the same and one person has more experience than the other. Um, you ha I guess demonstrating behaviors that fit the position and you'll have to learn this in the first couple interviews what what is successful in this job and how can you exhibit those behaviors how have you done that in the past to be successful um, if uh, the only differentiator is pure experience and the company's brought you in I mean I would have to ask my recruiter if you need three years experience and you brought one someone in with one year there must have been something that jumped out that made that candidate uh, worthy of the interview process. So that has to be identified. Now I'm talking as the company. I want to be sure my recruiter and my hiring manager have made a good decision that there is something that stands out. And it could be your education or where you got your education. It could be your accreditations. It could be some leadership you've demonstrated that has made up for the lack of on-the-job experience. So you may want to find out in early in the interview process what that is so that you can reinforce it during the rest of the day. You talked a little bit about interview etiquette, sending follow-up notes. If someone has a phone interview, does that also uh, indicate that they should send a thank you note if I'm interviewed over the phone? Do I need to follow up or should I follow up with a thank you note? My recommendation would be yes. Uh, I think what you want to be is consistent in how you handle your personal etiquette, how you man manage yourself. And again, what you're doing is you're demonstrating how you respond to, this is a business situation. It's a business discussion. So it would be good, my recommendation would be to send the personal thank you note and uh, you know, demonstrate your appreciation for their time and their consideration. And be truthful. Again, if it's uh, something of interest, uh, say that. You're interested in it. Sometimes it's important to know what to do, and sometimes it's just as important to know what not to do. Uh, we've talked about mostly positive, what you should do as you sell yourself during the interview. What's the worst thing you can do walking in during an interview? Tim, good question. Thank you. The worst thing you can do from my vantage point, and uh, I'll, if Jill's voice can jump in, uh, she'll, I'm sure, add to this, but you cannot fabricate yourself. Don't puff up your resume. Be absolutely true to yourself, and like I mentioned earlier, do not put things out there you're going to have to explain away. Uh, put things out there that you can add to, demonstrate even greater clarity of what you did. If you, you know, puff up your responsibilities, if uh, for some reason you incorrectly put your GPA down, those are things you cannot recover from. It's like showing up late. Uh, you can get over not being energized first thing in the morning, or maybe your tie's not straight, or something else is wrong, but being late, fabrication, are two things that you cannot recover from. Uh, another question here, and this is, I think you'll know who this is. Uh, when someone was doing college recruiting for you, uh, you, were t you told them to hire, quote, attitude. Um, and can you elaborate on basically what that is? Uh, that you could teach the person a lot, but you couldn't teach them attitude. What, what is it that you were talking about there? Um. I guess we all have our uh, isms in our life. and. Uh, I don't want to disappoint anyone, but I think I only hired two people with four O's in 35 years. Perfect GPAs. What I'm looking for is someone who's enthused about themselves and where they want to go, and they have a vision of where that where they want to be, and they're also, I guess, willing to become engaged. And to me, engaged in the company is, you know, on the good days it's easy to come in, but they're also pumped up on the days when it's a challenge, when it's a little dark and the rain's coming down. Uh, they're still excited about getting in there. So someone with the right attitude is engaged in what we're doing. They want to win. They're creative. They have empathy. They're sensitive. They demonstrate those skills that a leader has. And it uh, would be nice to have all good grades, but uh, you don't need a 4-0 to demonstrate those behaviors. So that's the attitude I was looking for. And then as a manager, for those of you that may be on the call, you've got to give those folks a vision and let them manage themselves. Uh, you've got to give people room to grow and let that attitude take advantage of what they can do for you. Uh, should you contact the hiring manager? Uh, what's the protocol on that when you're when you're going through the interview process? 
Yeah, that's the hiring manager may be one of four or five people you meet during the day, and what you should do is demonstrate your that you can follow instructions. It's as simple as that. Uh, uh, if the HR person who is conducting the uh, orienting the day for you says they'll contact you and within five days, I would let that play out to uh, circumvent that or to call the hiring manager the next day or that evening. Unless you had a personal understanding with that individual, uh, what you're demonstrating is you can't follow instructions. And again, what you don't want to do is allow anything in the decision process that could become a negative for you. So simply following instructions is, is important. And there'll come a moment when you can uh, contact that individual, but I would follow the individual who coordinated your interview process and let them set the cues for the process. Tom, in most cases in life, you try to interview and, and move up in companies and move up in compensation. But when you get a situation where you're going in to interview for a position and you know that that position is going to pay you less than the current position that you're at and you know that you're going to get a question about that, how do you handle it? Well, uh, this, this is a good question not only for someone who's working but also for uh, students that are graduating. And when you look at the offer, the questions that you on the screen, looking at your one to five year plan, your five to ten, and to become concerned over a thousand or three thousand dollars in the offer or a step back, you lose five percent in bonus or something like that, and you lose sight of the bigger picture of where you're going and what the company can do, is really a fool's gold decision. Uh, I've talked to many students that once an offer is within a reasonable 5% difference of one another, you pretty much got the same offer. You have to assess the company and what that upside opportunity is. And if you're confident in yourself, if you've prepared well and you know it's a good match, that, that missing 1000 or 3000 up front is not going to make a difference. Uh, you have to take in other considerations. The company has uh, other recent hires. They have compression issues. What you want is a chance to demonstrate you can differentiate and focus on that money. Those small differentials will get lost quickly as you move up. Since we're on the topic of money, when is it appropriate to talk about money in the interviewing process? Well, uh, this is a, a temptation some folks cannot uh, pass up, but I would recommend for those that are interviewing is to wait for the organization to pose an offer. Uh, almost all of you will be asked to fill out an application. There will be a space where you put down what your salary expectations are. I've seen everything from blank to negotiable to the ridiculous. And I think what you want to do when you leave the day, your interviewer should do this. If your HR department is prepared, uh, if things are moving well, they may ask for a range that's a reasonable consideration. They're not talking about a number. And what that's good for is to avoid any embarrassments. If there's a significant difference in nations, those can be determined immediately and moved out of the way. But it's, a, it's, it's not good form to uh, initiate uh, salary discussions on your, your side during the interview process. Um, that should be done if you're a midterm individual, your recruiter that's helping you, or your headhunter. Uh, who's supporting you in the search process, they should take care of that and make sure it's within range before you even get there. So I would wait to the second interview or later, and that would be uh, the best way to do that. And you would also then find out much more about benefits and other support. Well, and I think you've, you've pretty much partially or fully answered the next question, which is when negotiating a wage, what's the best way to sell yourself on what you're asking for? Well, uh, I. I I started my career a long time ago as a compensation manager, and I guess it was a little bit easier back then, but now the internet has provided enormous amounts of data in the marketplace to all individuals if they look. Uh, it's certainly uh, not unreasonable at some point to present what uh, market rate is and uh, certainly show where you've been in your current employment out of school. You may have some experience, which is a benefit to you. You may have internships, which are differentiators. Or you may be just straight out of school. Those will give you three different types of pay in the marketplace. But you know, seeing what the market has to offer, uh, most compensation people and uh, recruiters expect to see some market data from individuals, and uh, that's OK. But I, again, I would wait to later in the process uh, when they ask you what your expectations are. And if you do it in a professional manner like that, and you have data to back you up, it makes the, the decision process. Better. Get off the topic of money for a second and go back to the interview itself. You want to be. I believe as an interviewee, self-confident, prepared for the interview. Where do you think an interviewee should draw that line between confidence and cockiness? 
when does self-confidence become too much? Okay, uh, that, that's a good point. First thing you need to do is make sure who you're interviewing with. Now, the interviewing manager for the open position may be a bit of a different discussion, manager or other peer managers. So know who the interviewer is and you want to be confident, but certainly when you feel you cross the line and you're falling into the area of bragging, one of the, one of the clues will be is that you're talking too much, okay? And you're not getting to the point, or you're not answering the question they ask you, and you're trying to get, you know, you're starting to sound like a politician. You're going to tell them the answer you want to tell them, not what they want to hear. Um, hiring manager probably is the most important person, and with them you want to display confidence in the abilities that you have the skills to do the job and beyond. Uh, today's world, succession planning is very, very important in talent management, and for you to differentiate yourself that you certainly can do or be are capable of doing the job that's open, but you have the ability to move up in the organization, um, that's an important position to have. That gives the manager a different way to think about you as they problems and this sort of accountability because I know this person can move up. Um, being aggressive or overconfident or trying to dress just way too flashy are all things that can become a differentiator in a role. Okay, next question is uh, talking about role. For example, if you're aiming for a VP or senior director position and the job you're interviewing for is, man is for manager, should you pursue the position after the first interview to see if you can persuade the company that you can be successful as a VP or should you walk away? Well, if I understand the question, you'd like to be a VP? Right. But the opening position, open position is a manager. Yes. Okay, um, those are two different levels of responsibility in the organization in terms of autonomy and complexity of the problem. So to become a VP or a senior director, you're going to have to demonstrate uh, some very strong leadership skills and uh, an understanding of the vision of the company. So that's going to be a tough jump to go from manager to that position. But to take the managerial position with the intent of developing to that there's nothing wrong with that, and in today's marketplace, I'm sure many of you heard, when I left school, I didn't think this was the truth. You're going to work for six, seven, eight, nine companies in your career. There'll be times when you move laterally or maybe even a step back because the titling may be different from company to company, but you want to position yourself to learn the business, uh, gain the credibility, and be given the autonomy to move up to that senior level. So it's, uh, it's about managing yourself, and it's an investment if you're comfortable and confident and take that managerial position with the intent clearly of becoming a senior director or VP, uh, that's okay. Now this next question goes back a little bit to the question about confidence and cockiness, but how do you go about interviewing or working for a manager or a boss that has less education than you? Maybe has attained, whether it's less education, less experience, is there something that you should do differently in the interview process? Well, I, this is a little bit about managing up. I mean, we all think about managing subordinates. And in your career, you're going to have to manage your relationship with peers and manage up. And I did have, uh, it was a Purdue student who actually was with us for about four or five months and came to me and he told me his, his manager couldn't boot his PC. What do I do? How do I talk to him? And that's, a, that's the beginning piece of leadership. If you have a manager who is less educated than you, you got to remember they have experience. They may have already endured or solved complexity in, in the workplace, and they've been recognized as being worthy of the accountability. So you will find in your career that you may be working with someone who has no degree at all. Learn from it. It's very powerful, and it's about becoming a leader because it's about it's a different form of listening. Uh, it's likely you can learn a lot from that individual. In fact, uh, we have at our company a leadership development program, which is very similar to a lot of companies in our, our factories. Uh, we've, our factories were unionized, about 500 employees, um, very sort of old line. And the new students coming out of the MBA programs or engineering programs were given mentors by the company. That's the assigned mentor, not a real true mentor. But they were also given a senior hourly employee who knew the business as a sort of a secondary mentor. And probably 75% of the time, the feedback was the most powerful person to help them understand the business was that hourly employee that helped them understand how to make the product. So this is about learning and being open. 
And if, if uh, you have a manager you can't talk to, you have to develop your own style and how to share knowledge, demonstrate, work with the staff or her staff in communicating with the individual. But uh, you'll be surprised. You will learn from people in those situations. We want to thank everybody for all the questions. And before we wrap things up, I want to go back to both Jill and to Tom to see if they have any final comments. Jill, we'll start with you. And again, for those of you tuning in a little bit late, uh, Jill is under the weather. She's been a trooper to come in. Again, we, we thank her for her time today. Uh, uh, Tom has done really a great job filling in the, on both his parts and Jill's parts. And um, the final thought is from Jill, and I, w I won't make her uh, <laughs> scratch the voice anymore. Uh, you won't always know what questions will be asked in the interviewing process, but if you have well-developed stories, you'll be able to tweak and tailor your responses based on the questions. So as Tom mentioned, write out and practice your stories. And Tom, I think that's really good uh, advice for everybody. You can never be too prepared for something, and the interview is something you just can't walk in cold and expect to nail. Yeah, my last comment, Tim, is uh, I've mentioned it a couple times, but uh, remember, knowing yourself is true wisdom. Be an interesting person, gracious and engaging at all times, and that will be a powerful message to that organization, how you carry yourself and how you'll be successful within that team. Well, Tom and Jill, thanks to both of you. We hope everybody has enjoyed this webinar. If you have any comments on today's webinar or suggestions for future webinars, please send those to us at Cranert News, that's K-R-A-N-N-E-R-T News, all one word, at purdue.edu. In the meantime, you can watch the Cranert website at www.cranert.purdue.edu, and we'll post our further webinars there. For the Cranert School and for Jill Mullins and Tom McDuffie, this is Tim Newton. Thanks for joining us for this edition of Cranert On.